Having made the decision early on to forego the life of a professional composer or a performing musician, and instead earn his money with a stable office job in the insurance business, Charles Ives cannot be said to have captured the American public of his time with his rapturously unique symphonic music. The concert-going public instead knew, in addition to the standard European orchestral fare, the works of American composers like John Knowles Payne and George Templeton Strong, who certainly had been born in this country, but whose training and aesthetic inclinations were firmly rooted in the German Brahmsian tradition. But Ives was no stranger to the symphony, and the genre distinctly punctuated each of his compositional periods. His very first venture of the sort was his senior thesis at Yale, a product of the training he received from Horatio Parker, another German-trained American, entitled Symphony No. 1 and completed in 1899. By all accounts, it's a solid, even precociously accomplished piece of student work, but one which bears precious little resemblance to the band music in hymns Ives had known and loved as a child, and which would resurface so often in his later, more mature compositional efforts. Still, Ives' next symphony would point clearly towards the future. Sketches and ideas that would become his symphony number two date back to the student years at Yale, but the piece itself was not actually completed until 1901, by which time Ives was firmly ensconced in the insurance business. And setting a grim precedent for the performance of nearly all of Ives' music within his lifetime, the symphony would not receive its premiere for another half century, when Leonard Bernstein performed it in 1951 with the New York Philharmonic. But everything about it showed hints of mature Ives. Scored for a fairly conventional orchestra, Ives handily acknowledged the European tradition, especially with the piece's emblematic opening passage. But he also incorporated all manner of American music into the piece, recomposing and manipulating tunes like America the Beautiful and Camptown Races, weaving them into the orchestral fabric of this composition in an entirely new and inventive way. His Symphony No. 3, entitled The Camp Meeting, composed from 1908 to 1910 and premiered in 1947, followed in this experimental vein. Conceived on a smaller, more intimate scale than his previous two symphonic efforts, Ives cast this piece in three movements for a chamber orchestra. Not only was this the first symphony he gave a specific name, he departed from the usual Italian tempo indications in designating each movement, giving them here the names Old Folks Gathering, Children's Day, and Communion. I've stated that he sought to recall the social gatherings of his youth, and in this way, his Symphony No. 3 more resembles an American tone poem than a symphony, very much like his immensely popular Three Places in New England, which he finished shortly afterwards. Ives' last completed symphony is Symphony No. 4, is viewed by many experts as the culmination of his efforts in the genre, and one prepared by his many years of experimenting, constantly trying out new methods and compositional arguments in his prior symphonic work. And while this was his last finished symphony, Ives had not yet said everything he had to say. He left sketches for a universe symphony, a mammoth, sprawling work depicting nothing less than the creation of the universe and intended to be performed outdoors by multiple orchestras simultaneously spread over a vast expanse of terrain, some located on mountaintops and hillsides and some in valleys. We will never hear this performed, of course, but there could be no better summation of the great American originalist using the symphonic genre to once again chart out completely unknown territory.